What an honor it is to be with you all tonight to talk about something that we all so deeply love and share together, and that's our campus. I'll begin with sharing some reflections about its beginnings, the history of Notre Dame a bit through the eyes of three great builders of the university, each a visionary leader who saw at least one transformational moment in its beloved history. Of course, that begins with Father Soren, our founder. Father Soren was many things, had many attributes and traits. He was a really courageous leader, entrepreneurial in many ways, truly visionary, and yet despite having no architectural training, his background turned out to be an innate planner. Here evidenced an early drawing of the campus. There's a cluster of buildings at the very top end, embraced by the two lakes. And then a mile-long vista, Soren drew himself and labeled Notre Dame Avenue that terminated in a small village at the south end, a village that he designed and created, single-family homes to attract those who would come teach and build this great university. And you can almost make out the words in that curved fashion there, those letters that say Sorensville. True story, <laughs> true story. Back at that north end, there were two principal buildings in that era. To the left, the first church. By 1871, Soren laid the foundation for the church that eventually became the basilica that we know and love today. It was built to the south of this church, and brick by brick, over 25 years, that building was built and eventually replaced this church. The building to the right, of course, is the main building, main building number two. Soren took down the first one because it was just simply too small. But he thought this was going to be it. This was the entire university. It was where the students slept. It's where they took their classes. They took their meals and the faculty taught. It was the place of the first art museum at Notre Dame, topped with a tin dome and a tin statue of Mary. Of course, we know what happened on a fateful day in April of 1879. It's been attributed through history that roofers were repairing the cold tar pitch roof, and an ember went astray, and it caught the wood structure of the roof on fire, unbeknownst to those who were right there, and with a matter of hours took the entire university down. Fortunately, no one was hurt. Soren, who was no longer president at the time, he was actually in Montreal the day of the fire, getting ready to take a transatlantic trip back to Le Mans, France, the home of the Holy Cross Order. Father Corby was the president, sent a courier up quickly to go find Soren and bring him back. Within four days, he's walking among the ruins, stoically thinking about what had happened, but more importantly, what he would do next. He gathered those that were there into the new church, and Soren kneeled on the steps before the altar and prayed. And when he was done praying, he said this. He turned to the congregation and said, even if all were gone, I should rebuild. This was my fault. When I was a young priest, I founded the university and named it for the Mother of God. She's the one that took it down to tell me that I dreamed too small. Tomorrow, we'll build again. We'll start rebuilding a bigger and better university, and when we're done, we will put a gold dome on it with a gold statue of Mary above so that it is a reminder to all who come to whom we owe our great fortune and blessings. So he rallied everyone, went to Chicago very quickly, within a couple of days, hired an architect, Willoughby, and they designed the new main building. By May 10th, just a few weeks after the fire, the cornerstone that we see today on that building was laid. 300 people were rallied to begin to make bricks. They pulled the mud and the marl out of the bottom of St. Mary's Lake, and they built a kiln next to it, and they fired two million bricks that summer to build the core of the main building. And remarkably, by September, just four months after starting, the university reopened into the main building that we know today. Yeah, the wings came later, as did the rotunda that supports the dome within a handful of years. But Soren knew that if he did not reopen 
school that fall, then the dream may have perished in that fire. Now, every time I talk about this particular story, I tend not to look at Shannon because I know he'll have a quizzical look on his face. Okay, so Soren, with 300 people, in four months could reopen the university, <laughs> build this structure. Why, Marsh, does it take you five and six years to hire architects, design, and build an art museum that we've been waiting for so long for? And I don't have a good answer for him, so let's just go on. <laughs> this is one of the extraordinary photos we have in our archives. And I love the two stories this photo tells. The humility in the foreground, these very simple farm buildings remind us that even this many years into the experiment, Notre Dame was still fledgling, hand to mouth, farm to table, if you will, surrounded by hundreds of acres of crops that fed the students and fed the faculty and the teachers and those who were there, the, including the, the community. Yet Soren saw beyond that and saw the potential. You could see that he had finished the dome by now. He still had another five years before the steeple went on to the church. And then to the right, he built the Performing Arts Center, the first one at Notre Dame called Washington Hall, named for his favorite president. Take quite a vision from that humble surroundings to see through these buildings. Within a few years, electricity comes to campus, mid-1880s. And someone gets the idea to string lights around Mary's head as if in a halo. And so these intrepid five or six souls were nominated to scale up the slippery slope of the Golden Dome with all but a rope. And you can see there's actually two men on her shoulders, 220 feet in the air, so, so to speak. It's remarkable. Here's a close-up of one of those intrepid souls bravely hanging on with that rope in a tiny little platform. Well, decades and decades later, we do it a little more safely, but I have to say, this fool was very much <laughs> in a white knuckle mode as he climbed the, the, st the scaffold this summer to look at the great work of artisans who worked sometimes six and seven days a week, not because we asked them, but because they wanted to. They loved the work, and they knew what it meant to us, and there was a goal to get it that, that done and, and ready for school and the start of football season to welcome all of our visitors as soon as possible. We owe great debt of gratitude to these workers who took micron-thin sheets of gold leaf and painstakingly burnished it onto the dome and onto Mary's, uh, the statue. Matched by the skill and the care of iron workers who built an enormously beautiful scaffold that never touches the dome in its structure and its making. And so as time went on, this fall that came down and reveals that view, that view that Soren wanted to express to us, that we're reminded every time we turn down Notre Dame Avenue to whom we owe our great blessings and fortunes. The next great builder of Notre Dame, in my view, only has one building to his credit, and that's Newt Rockne. Rockne came to Notre Dame in 1910 as a 22-year-old student of chemistry, and turns out, pretty good student of chemistry. He was also a two-sport athlete. Legend has it he actually preferred baseball over football. Well, he graduates in 1914, and he gets two jobs at Notre Dame. One, to teach chemistry under the tutelage of Father Newland, and secondly, to become an assistant football coach under Jess Harper, the true father of Notre Dame football. Well, Harper moves on, leaves Notre Dame four years later, 1918, and Rockney gets the tap. He's now the head coach of Notre Dame and goes on to have this legendary career we all know about, 12 seasons, three national championships. At that time, the football team was known as the Ramblers because they literally would ramble coast to coast to play the great teams of that era, Army, Navy, USC, Michigan, et cetera, but in the great stadia, 
from the Coliseum to Soldier Field to Yankee Stadium. And we take that spirit to this day. We'll play anybody, anywhere. Barockney knew also we needed to attract teams to South Bend, but he had a humble facility to do it in. The Cartier Field at the most sat 15,000. And of course, at the time, the revenue source was the ticket gate, and teams would refrain from coming to South Bend to play in this tiny stadium. And so Rockney, seeing what Fielding Yost had done at Michigan in the early 20s, building Michigan Stadium, found the designer and the builder of the Osborne Engineering in Cleveland, Ohio. And he goes to Osborne and he has designs made for a new Notre Dame Stadium built in scale to Michigan Stadium. He takes those plans to the president of the university at the time, Father Matthew Walsh, and he, he makes an appeal, he makes his argument, and Father Walsh says, I understand, Rock, but be patient. We've got some other priorities. In fact, we, we need to get all of our students onto campus. We have to build three dorms, Lyons, Howard, Morrissey, and we need to build a dining hall to feed them, South Dining Hall. When those are done, come back and see me. Well, eventually, those are completed in about 1928. The plan goes forward. Rockney takes his team on the road for the entire 1929 season so that construction of Notre Dame Stadium can begin. And by fall of 1930, it is opened. You can see the campus. It's still quite a, quite a bit away from that location. In fact, Eddy Street, was Eddie Road, and it went up on the west side of Notre Dame Stadium. The closest buildings were the law school, and what's now Riley Art was once a chemistry building as it first opened in the 1920s. Well, over the next many years, the campus continued to march to the, to the south and to the east towards the stadium, put pressure on that road, so by 1945, the road had to be moved, and it was renamed Juniper Road. It went on the east side, you can just see it in the bottom right corner as the campus marched that direction. It was in that location for another 40 years. Campus continued to grow and eventually embraced Notre Dame Stadium, unlike any campus has engulfed and embraced its major athletic fields and, 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 uh, and stadia. And new life brought to that part of campus, thanks to a capstone project like this one, the Campus Crossroads, where academic and student life and great meeting space like we're in tonight brought an excitement and, and daily activity to an otherwise forgotten part of campus other than six or seven Saturdays a year. Finally, any conversation about the great builders of Notre Dame has to include, of course, Father, Father Ted. Father Ted Hesburgh here with the board in the early 60s at the groundbreaking of the library that now bears his name. Father Ted became president in 1952. The university was very much still struggling in a post-World War era. Our academic prowess was not up to Soren's dream and vision, and, and Father Ted realized that, knew he needed to make a bold move. So he envisioned building the largest university library on any campus at nearly half a million square feet. It was going to take quite a bit of resources, and it turns out the Ford Foundation was out identifying upstart schools, places like Stanford, Johns Hopkins, and Notre Dame, and brought challenge grants to them. They came to Father Ted and said, if you raise 12 million, we'll, we'll match it with six. And in true Father Ted fashion, he goes, no, no thank you. We'll, We'll raise 18 to that six. And with that, I can not only build a building, but I can invest in our faculty and truly make Notre Dame strong. And that was the root of the very first formal fundraising campaign at Notre Dame called Challenge One. If you knew Father Ted, it wasn't going to take very long to make that challenge happen. And it, was, it, it launched the construction of the building, 14 stories, the tallest building on the Indiana Prairie between between Chicago and then into Cleveland. It was a bold move made only bold, more bold by placing the Lord surrounded by saints and saviors, saints and scientists on the facade. 
to tell the world, all who come, to whom we trust and put our faith in and who, where our love lies. It's the backdrop of the most photographed vista on the most important and happiest day of every year, Commencement Sunday. Here Father Ted is late in life, looking from the 13th floor office out onto campus and notice through the glass it's Geddes Hall. He was the ultimate sidewalk superintendent during that construction and I was given the privilege of showing that to him in the completed stage and he loved it very, very much. Father Ted was teamed in his legacy and his leadership with Father Ned Joyce as executive vice president for all 35 years of their leadership. They were prolific builders. 35 buildings were built in that era. And here they are early, looking at an architect's latest model. And particularly with a proposal in the lower right of a new church, very Space Mountain-like, on the north side of the library, surrounded partially by five tower residence halls. Well, somehow, we didn't build all that. Maybe, gratefully, we did build two halls, Grace and Flanner, that now are office buildings. But we had a couple other gifts in that era. In the upper right, Steppen Center. Now, I happen to have a, a kind of a crush on that building uh, I'm inspired by it because I, I look outside my office window in front of the power plant every day and I see the step in center. And uh, I, I'm, it gives me a little warmth. I don't know. It's, it's kind of a funny thing. And then to the lower right is the CCMB building. That's what it was originally called, now home to our uh, IT uh, folks. And it was at first, though, the, the, the place that the university had its first and only computer. Uh, for the longest time. It was inspired architecturally by the IBM computer punch card. True story. There's, there's a lot of similarities there. While the library was truly transformational in Father Ted's era, there was one proposal that did not happen, and we're, we're grateful for it. This is a sketch that we did find in archives as well. In the 1950s, the main building had not really been anything happened to it since it was constructed in 1879, and, and it was in disrepair. And particularly the fifth floor had to be condemned and closed off because the floors and walls were sagging. It wasn't until the 1990s that we did our renovation we found out what was going on. In the haste to construct it in that summer of 1879, workers took scraps, the cutoffs as the building finished off and nailed them together to make full members. The joists and the, and the studs, no wonder over time they began to sag and had to be closed off. Gratefully, we've, we're, I can assure you, we went and replaced all that wood in the 90s, and so it, it was very stable. But there was a consideration, a proposal to actually take the building down and replace it with this modern office building to the north but leave Mary in place, spatially, in the same location, but on a 200-foot tall pedestal in the midst of this very modern square. So we're grateful that this transformation did not occur, of course. But change, of course, continues to happen at Notre Dame, and it has, particularly in the decades since, especially the last two decades, particularly made possible by a key moment in time about 20 years ago when that road that had been put in place in 1945 had to be moved again. And so through a very public process with a lot of remonstrance, the county and the city leaders finally acquiesced and allowed us to build Twickenham and straighten Angela and eventually uh, actually bow out Douglas Road so that we could maximize the, the university's area within the perimeters in, in, in the midst of that perimeter road. And so it unlocked the potential of over 200 acres on the east side of the library and east side of the stadium, unlike we've ever had before. It wasn't that long ago the campus looked like this at the end. Before the Performing Arts Center was built, it was just a field with this very awkward road, and then just down Eddy Street, Eddy colliding with South Bend Avenue and Corby 
creating this awkward five points intersection. In my day, there was literally a bar on every corner. I have classmates that still call that the good old days. <laughs> but literally on that same intersection is where Trader Joe's exists. Trader Joe's, the sort of exclamation point on the $300 million economic development of Eddy Street Commons that was another building block in the re -energy, re -energy, the metamorphosis of the Northeast <laughs> neighborhood. <laughs> Wasn't that long ago, Eddy Street looked like this. Dominated by absentee landlords were the more than happy to rent substandard housing to our students. And what's taken place in the last 20 years is truly remarkable. We have a whole new generation of folks reinvesting in this community, but not with just new housing for our administration, our, our faculty, our leadership, but beyond. Families that have been there for generations, homesteaders reinvesting in their properties because they see hope. They see new vitality throughout the entire neighborhood cascading from the steps of the edge of campus into downtown. Back on campus, Taking that empty lot, Monk Malloy decides to put the Performing Arts Center, the first step in the creation of the Arts Gateway into South Bend, to welcome the community, come in to one of the great performing arts venues inside this structure, or come and listen to a lecture in the Walsh School of Architecture and see the beautiful work of our architecture students. Or within a few weeks, in fact, dedicated tomorrow, to come and see this world-class new university art museum, the Rackland Murphy Museum of Art, the capstone of the Charlie Hayes Sculpture Park. And as one looks back over to the north, you see the glimpse of O'Neill Hall of Music, the home of our extraordinary music program and programs in sacred music. And then as we, if we kept on a flight over the stadium and looked over that northeast edge, we see was, where once was a road is now home to a new quad, home to three and soon four residence halls, and also our next research building, the second McCourtney Hall of Research that will give the university 450,000 square feet of class A, world-class, wet lab research space so that our scholars can continue the pursuit of answers to the biggest questions and challenges uh, that our world faces. As we think about the future and we look at our campus, as we do our planning, we go back to our roots. We go back to what makes us distinct, and particularly with respect to the outdoor space. In this drawing, I've, I've painted green, sort of highlighted the the wonderful quadrangles. They're the envy of our peers. They tie the campus together. They're really the thread that weaves this whole place together from a physical standpoint. I've also highlighted in yellow the 34 residence halls, home to our undergraduate student body and, and so many others. I put boxes around them. They create two neighborhoods, one to the north and one to the west. And those are like arms to me that embrace our academic buildings. This isn't by chance. This is decades and decades of planners before us thinking about the proper placement of buildings and how they relate to each other and the connectivity that that brings. We're mindful of getting campus too big, how, how to responsibly grow campus but without letting it grow too far at the edges. And so we're constantly thinking about opportunities for strategic infills. And over the last 15 years, there's been many examples of this, including Geddes Hall, who replaced a 7,000 square foot, very modest structure with that beautiful building. And as you heard recently, more opportunities by taking halls that have served us so well, Pangborn Hall and my hall, Fisher Hall, letting them gracefully retire this coming summer and be replaced eventually over the next couple of years with two new halls, one men's hall and one women's hall. That'll be the, the punctuation mark at the end of the South Quad. 
We're also have, we also have a huge responsibility as stewards of buildings that we'll keep, including all of our residence halls. And so we've had this tradition of taking halls offline for a year to go strategically in, into them and, and, and reinvest in them. Alumni Hall just reopened this fall. Green Phillips is offline this year for the same kind of treatment. We'll continue to do that as we march around campus. Doesn't stop with just residence halls. We're reinvesting in our South Dining Hall, not changing the beautiful dining spaces, but how we serve our students and prepare the meals in the core of the building. One of the first projects I worked on when I arrived here in the mid-90s was a renovation of this hall in that same area. And so now I'm renovating renovations that I did earlier. That may be a signal that I'm getting quite old here. <laughs> While you're on campus this weekend, I invite you to stop in to the library on the first and second floors and see this wonderful new addition. It's the last piece of the modernization of the first two floors of the Hesburgh Library, the Beth and Lou Holtz Grand Reading Room. It's an extraordinary space. Our students have found it and they fall in love with it. We dedicated this just, just a few weeks ago. I'll leave you with this. And it's probably the most important message I can convey tonight. There are seven tenets of planning that guide the Notre Dame campus plan. And the first by far is the most important. And that is everything we do will be through a sacramental vision. Because after all, Notre Dame is not a, just a place of study, but it's a place of prayer. It is not just a place of intellectual pursuits, but it's a place of spiritual formation. All those things together shall collectively resonate in the campus, both the built as well as the natural environments that make up this beautiful place. And we're reminded of that with these examples with Soren placed above the east portal into the basilica, engraved in stone, God, country, Notre Dame. We're reminded of that in our incredible tradition of nearly 60 chapels on our campus, in every residence hall and many academic buildings. And in the lower left, the most sacred outdoor space here at campus, the grotto. And the lower right, a new sacred space, opened just last year, the new Peace Plaza on the shore of St. Mary's Lake, on the virtual foundation of that kiln that made those bricks that built the main building. Father John announced last summer, in celebration of the 50th anniversary of women's admission to the under, undergraduate class of, at Notre Dame, an opportunity to reconstruct the main circle in dedication to that. And so a group of us have been working on that ever since, and we're hopeful that perhaps by summer we'll be ready to start work on that, and it'll create the next sacred space here at Notre Dame. I'll conclude by simply saying thank you. Thank you for the love that we all share for this extraordinary place at Notre Dame. Thank you for everything you do to make this place so special. Go Irish. Have a great evening.